Thanks, Joe, and everyone who's been already serving this morning, marshals and, and so on. So as we go to put our name on a list or tick a box, um, all of you help um, this gathering to take place. And so um, you might want to prayerfully consider how you can be a blessing to the congregation as well. Well, let, let's uh, open in prayer. My name's David, if, if we haven't yet met. I look forward to meeting you. Let's pray. Lord, as we learn more and more to resemble the Lord Jesus and what it means to be his disciples, we thank you that you use our little lives for your grand purposes. Encourage us in this by your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the numbers are uncertain, but some say the church in China may be somewhere between 60 to 100 million in size. 60 to 100 million believers. Now, the numbers get a little bit difficult to count, I take it. But when we compare that with Australia's population, it's breathtaking, isn't it? Three times our population uh, could call on Christ as Lord. From little things, big things grow uh, in China and in Jermoyne. Uh, recently, as a family, we've been reading a biography of Gladys Aylward who went to China and not much seeming to be happening in the villages she was going to, but faithful she was. Um, another story was uh, that, that I read of recently with two Christians who travelled through rural towns in the early part of the 20th century distributing Mark's Gospel or some of the Gospels and parts of the New Testament. Uh, they'd go around and, and sell them at a really affordable price so that the Word of God could spread throughout China. In one town, they were sharing about the Lord Jesus with a farmer. And as this farmer listened to the, the biography of Jesus, the story of Jesus, he said, I know the man you're talking about. He lives in the next village. Well, no, no, you don't understand. Jesus lived a long time ago here on earth. You, you couldn't know him in the next village. But the farmer insisted, and he insisted on taking these two messengers to the next town to meet the man he thinks of as Jesus. They entered into his humble home, um, were introduced to the man and heard the story. You see, years earlier, this man, on a, a previous trip, had purchased a gospel of Mark and he pulled out his little booklet, tattered and well-loved, embraced, believed. And so the man owning this book had been transformed by the gospel he'd been reading. When people in his area heard of Jesus, they thought of this man, this Christian, this Christian, as I'll call it in this sermon, uh, connecting Christ with the Christian, as we should. It's inspiring, isn't it? I wonder if your, some of your friends were to somehow hear about Jesus, if they would naturally turn their minds to you. I think, I know someone like that. And what would we have to look like, do you think, to look like a person like Jesus in Des Moines, in the inner west in 2021? What does a Jesus person, a Christian, look like when living among us? One scholar says that the Christian church is, for the world around us, the best biography of Christ, a living witness, little lights obviously drawing their light from a bigger source. Will you take me to that source? Christ chose to make himself known to this world by means of the church. It's humbling, isn't it? Churches like DPC have that responsibility of being Christ to the world and making him known to the world. It's a very challenging way of, of viewing ourselves. It leads us to lift our sights as to what our purpose is. You, we, are where Christ's lives are. Uh, lives and can be seen today. Australians before us had their time. Just look at the building we inherit by becoming a Christian. People before us have had faith, have given sacrificially. We benefit from books that have been published before us. Children and grandchildren throughout Australia's history instructed in the ways of the Lord. We've had Billy Graham crusades, beach missions year after year, Scripture Union, Bible colleges established, Sunday schools all around the country where people are sharing Jesus with children. P. 
people committed to witnessing to the light of Christ in their time and their place. Big contributions and little contributions. But knowing that from little things, big things grow. Recently, I, I counted the number of Sunday school teachers I could remember. I, I don't know the final number, but it was about 12 to 15. I need to sit down and count it. It was such a pleasant memory, remembering people who'd invested into my life. Is not Christ's strategy one that says, if you want to know me, look at them. They will resemble me. They, they will represent me. My words will be heard from their voices. So, Lord, what does the Christian life look like? And Peter points out three areas here in 1 Peter 4 that we can easily remember as we leave the building today. Firstly, or to put it simply, heads, hearts, and skin. Firstly, we'll develop Christ's will. We'll have a head that resembles him in our thinking. Christ's heart in verses 7 to 11. And thirdly, Christ's readiness to endure trials, his thick skin. So firstly, we resemble Christ with our wills as Christians. Now notice the enormous changes being demanded here in verses 1 to 6. More than a facelift to resemble Christ physically or start wearing sandals and, and old clothes, it's a change that firstly reaches our minds, our attitudes. Verse 1 mentions wills and desires. And verse 2 there as well. Let's have a look at it. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. So Christians are those resolved to say, I've had enough with sin. I'm done with it. Verse 2, as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human desires. We don't now live for selfishness, the craving for more and more that is just so normal in our society and praised, the passion to make a name for ourselves in our workplaces that might be driving us for a promotion that just isn't good for us. The quick buck, the worldly success, sexual gratification from some forbidden tap, the naughty weekend away from our spouse. No, Peter says we're done with sin. And mature Christians increasingly see sin for what it is and want no part of it anymore. The dark games, the getting away with it mentality. God will just let me get away with this. It all loses its appeal as we grow to treat the Lord of light as a person. So what is the Christian way? The denial of Buddhists and, and cut off our passions? Or perhaps go to a Christian monastery to escape being tempted by the world? Well, the good news is much better than that. The Christian life isn't all about denial of our passions so much as it is about channeling our passions and our desires toward God and what is good truly good for us. Notice the new pursuit at the end of verse 2. As a result, he does not live his life, that the rest of his life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. That's our interest. There's the goal. There's the worthy pursuit for us. There's life's steady source instead of those Red Bull jolts that we might seek to get life from, that ultimately aren't good for us, that fail us. But what does, Peter, what does that mean, Peter? Well, he explains from verse 3, and the gist of it is, to, to follow the will of God, is that we can't expect to follow the crowd. That, that's a good starting point. Beware the, the politician whose moral compass is the opinion polls. Or teenagers, beware the pursuit of popularity or the price tag of peer approval. Popularity and approval, not bad things in themselves. They're okay as byproducts, but they are cruel, unrelenting masters. And I think we all play to them to different degrees. I remember working out as a teenager that I couldn't be cool and a Christian at the same time sometimes. Sometimes you're forced to make a choice. You're being pulled in two directions. The will of God, verse 2, that's the loving pull of our Father. Trust that pull. Go that way. 
Verse 3 continues, For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, pagans just meaning the world, the nations, living in debauchery. That's a life without moral restraint. That summarizes my um, high school situation. Lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. That one stands out to me. The rest you kind of think, yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. The last one just seems so normal in Sydney. Not so much usual wooden idols as worshippers in our cathedrals, which are malls and cafes and gyms and showrooms. Image. Anything that substitutes the unwanted intrusion called God from restricting our choices. I don't mind God as long as he doesn't get in the way and I can still do what I want. I'll go where I go for my security, my pleasure, my sense of significance. Those things are an idol if it's not God himself. Now, if I'm sounding a little bit strange to our ears, our Aussie ears, Peter says these things will sound strange in verse 4. The world around us will think it strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. Of course, it's not only the Bible that warns of peer pressure. Good teachers will do the same. I noticed the Victorian government website speaking about Schoolies Week warns Victorian teenagers, watch out. Uh, I'll read an excerpt from the website. Schoolies may be a time when you find it hard to resist peer pressure. Your friends may be pressuring you to drink too much alcohol, take drugs you'd rather not, or have sex before you're ready. Or you may find yourself pressuring others to do things they don't want to do. Here are some suggestions to conquer peer pressure. And there's some great advice here for the church as well. Stick with friends who share your interests. Gathering together is really important. Secondly, remembering that it's okay to say no. And thirdly, stand up to peer pressure or help a friend who may be influenced by peer pressure to say no. I think that website accidentally provides great advice for disciples of Christ as well. Stick with friends who share your interests. Remember it's okay to say no. Stand up to peer pressure or help a friend who may be influenced to say no. Like those kids, even in grown-up society, Christians can be condemned for simply saying no to sin and yes to God. And we do have to be ready to cop the flack rather than just avoid saying no or avoid speaking. In a job I held as a young adult, sometimes when I took phone calls, my boss would tell me to say he wasn't in. They would just tell him I'm not in. As a young Christian, I thought I can't do that, and so I'd say, I'm sorry, my boss is unavailable at the moment. My boss would then overhear that and come back and say, David, I said I'm not in. I didn't tell you to say I'm not available. At that point, I have to choose which pull I'm going to go with. In our society, the pull, the pressure, can be to shut up or to stay out of the conversation, stay out of public life. No room for Christian intolerance in this workplace. The banks, the airlines, the classrooms, the cricket and football teams, keen to virtue signal, buckle under the pressure of that constant pull which says our view or else. But rather than Christians feeling pressured by this or threatened or see lobbying or debate as our chief response, our reflex, Peter points first to sympathy for our lost world. But, he says in verse 5, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Those who aren't interested in his will, watch out. See, Christians have no fear of the world. We have a fear for the world. For Jesus is ready now, verse 5, to judge those who refuse his righteous pull and are therefore pulling against him. You might think of the kindest person you know. It's a stern warning, even to the kindest person, not to pull against the will of God. Peter explains that those who have died now know this is true from personal experience. Christians who've gone before him, martyrs. 
All people who've died know this to be true. It's either going to be harrowing or exhilarating. See there in verse 6? For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. What does this mean? I think it means look at those who have already gone before us and died in the faith. We could think of Stephen, for example, in Acts chapter 6 and 7. You could have a look at that later. He was killed for siding with Jesus. He heard the gospel and was saved before being judged and killed by men with his earthly body. Stephen's example cries out that it's God's judgment that supremely counts. Stoned to death, yes, but now he lives with God. Or according to God, verse 6, in regard to his spirit. Yes, the dead, verse 6, might be judged according to men in regards to the body. They had their judgment. They found him unworthy of living. But these men and women live according to God in regard to the spirit. They're still very much alive. Stephen, that guy with crushed bones and a broken body. Yes, yeah, Stephen, the one with an eternal spirit at home with the true and living God. A Christian to the end. And remember Stephen's prayers. Like his Lord, this Christian Stephen, pulled in, the, in a direction away from God with that pressure to renounce him and yet determined to live for the will of God when he says two things. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Alive to God according to the spirit. The same words Jesus prays on the cross. Lord, receive my spirit. And second thing he said was, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Fear of them? No, fear for them. Lord, have mercy on my murderers. Verse 7, that the end of all things is near. Therefore, be, there it is again from previous weeks, clear-minded, sober-minded, not confused about the gospel and what's at stake, and self-controlled so that you can pray. This is what people who are waiting for Jesus do. In his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer says, the work of a pastor is to introduce people to the real world and train them to live in it. Real world being these spiritual realities, this great chasm awaiting us at our death. It's also the role of Bible study leaders, Sunday school teachers, parents, grandparents, each of his disciples. So firstly, then our minds, our wills align with that of the Lord Jesus. We start to think like he does. And secondly, besides our wills, is also our hearts which we see in verses 7 begins with love, unsurprisingly, above all. Above all, love each other deeply. We've already seen this in 1 Peter, haven't we? Peter bangs on about love because love covers over a multitude of sins. Here's the reason for it here. Loving one another deeply means sinners like us can actually get along pretty well. And hopefully that's been your experience here in DPC. You've been here much longer than I have, most of you. Yes, but she said this to me three years ago, and I just can't let it go. I can't forgive her. Well, we must. And perhaps if we loved her more, we would, and we could. The hard heart wants vengeance and justice and even the hurt of the other. The soft Christian heart, the Stephen heart, has pity on the wounding enemy and seeks forgiveness for her. Now, this can be taken simplistically. Um, it's not to deny that sometimes mediation is needed, confrontation is needed, rebuke can be needed, church discipline can be needed, where the church needs to step in and say, stop hurting him, her. We just can't always sweep big things under the carpet. Peter's not saying that. It would be foolish to keep trusting untrustworthy people or relate to people without some gentle assertiveness from time to time. But the loving heart is ready for and wanting and, and praying for reconciliation. It covers over a multitude of sins. My dad refers to it as bad shots playing golf. Let people have their bad shots. We all have some bad shots. I need others to forgive mine. 
let them go. And I need to let others go. Our love helps us get past things and have fresh starts. But love is also powerful because it shows itself, verse 9, as we offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. A recent minister I was talking to reckons, our generation, the church today, is less hospitable than it was when he went into ministry some 40 years ago. He says, we seem to have forgotten the art of simple meals and, and um, just basic hospitality in humble homes, perhaps because of MasterChef and the block and some of the pressures we might be feeling, perhaps busyness of our lifestyles. But these simple forms of ordinary kindness consistently change lives. Are we all able to be hospitable in the same way? No. But God says in there in verses 10 to 11 that whatever we have from God, we put to use for others. You might not have loads of time, but you have something. Verse 10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in notice its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. We had a DY meeting last, just in the last week. As a pastor, I was urging the DY team to please let us know if there are ways that we as a church can support them as a smaller part of the church. One of them said, it would be nice if we could occasionally meet in someone's house instead of the church hall. That would be homely, welcoming. One parent said, no problem. Homes would be ready when you want to do that. Need funds for supplies? Just tell us how much. Need a speaker to share Christ occasionally with the youth? We're lining up. Let us know when you need us. Why? So that we can receive praise for what we give or expect gratitude or thankfulness all the time towards us? That's not the motive. We're only sharing what God's already given us. See there in verses 10 to 11? These are received gifts. These are various forms of grace. These words that we're sharing are words of God. They're not our own. And so if I can hold a tune or make a mean lasagna and deliver it at a timely situation, then praise God for what he first provides, verse 11. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. So Christ's heads, uh, Christ minds with our heads, Christ's love with our hearts, and thirdly, thicker skin. Christ's readiness to endure suffering. Look with me at verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering. And these people are suffering more than we are for their Christian faith. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed, not if, but when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, Christians, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. They're getting what they deserve. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. What a challenge. That Christians are those willing and ready to bear the name of God. Privately and publicly, Christians. You couldn't follow Jesus from a closet. When Jesus said, follow me, that was something public. You couldn't follow him from your own house. You had to walk and be seen. He's hassling for me for being a Christian. I didn't get the job because I'm a Christian. Our kids missed rep sport opportunities because we're Christians. My bank balance constantly feels the gravity of being a Christian. Downward. Our brothers and sisters in Russia or China, North Korea, imprisoned or killed for refusing to be pulled from Christ. Are you ready to say, I'm Christ's, come what may? What will that look like for you to do that? For now is our time to take it on the chin, if necessary for God, verse 17. It's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who don't obey the gospel of God? It's not saying God is judging us now, but that we experience the worst of it now, ahead of our coming relief. For those, however, verse 17, who do not obey the gospel of God, what is ahead for them is far worse than anything they dish out to Christians now. 
In that sense, our hardest life is this life, here and now. Their hardest life is the next life. We don't fear the world, we fear for the world. As one saying puts it, for the Christian, this world is as close to hell as we will ever experience. And for the unrepentant, this world is as close to heaven as they will ever experience. And so Peter's conclusion for God's people. So then those who suffer according to God's will, there it is again, God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Rain, hail or shine, we're Christ's. Christ's in mind, Christ in heart and Christ in our endurance. Well, let's pray. Now, our great God, you are strong, and at times we feel very weak, listless and apathetic. Father, forgive us for perhaps the timid way we bear Christ's name. Forgive us if far too few people know that we are Christians, that we are yours. Father, if we're not enduring any persecution... If we're not standing out for bearing Christ's name, will you lead us to more boldness, to be more transparent with our lives and more ready to own you publicly? Lord, not just for the sake of being brave, but for the sake of those souls around us. And Father, when persecution does come, as we become bold, perhaps as we make bigger sacrifices, Uh, We pray that we'd be ready, that we'd have thick skin, and we count it a privilege to bear the name of the Lord Jesus and that we be called a Christian. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not allowed down yet. Uh, Question time. Uh, So I don't know if uh, folks have comments or questions, ideally. Yes, Suzanne. Yeah, so the question for those online, welcome to you as well, a late welcome, is can I help with verse 6 of 1 Peter 4? For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Uh, I take it that's an example like Peter would have seen, people who now have been killed, Stephen or just died of old age, who are now dead, but they received the gospel, and while they might have been judged and misjudged by the world, they're alive to God. So God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Um, So in the gospels we see... Uh, saints of Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, very much alive to God, even though they've been dead in the body. Um, so I'll just look at the verse. This is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body. So think of Stephen, stoned for his faith, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. They were pre- uh, Good question. So how were they preached to when they were dead? They, they were preached to while they were living, but now they're dead. So it's talking about, say, if I think of my grandfather, um, I could call him dead now. He, he's passed away. But while he was alive, he was preached to. Someone shared the gospel with him. The gospel's been preached to those who are now dead, but now they live according to God. Thanks for that clarification question. Anyone else? Good. So the question being from verse 12, uh, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal you're suffering. Um, This is suffering for being Christ's. Uh, But but Christy's asking, is this also applicable to those who are just suffering, whether through disability or uh, illness? Um, I think Peter's mainly tuned in to the problem of suffering 
of Christians for being Christians. And so I think the lessons there are are really hold on to Jesus, even though you're going to really cop it. Your family might cop it. And all the cost-benefit analysis would say, on this earth would say, just ditch Jesus. He's not worth it. And so this is why he's spending chapters 1 and 2, this is who you are, this is whose you are, so that they're ready to, to cop it, knowing where they're going. Having said that, I think it applies a lot to us in our difficulties as well. So if I've got a crippling illness or a chronic sickness and I just want this life to be over, I know where I'm going, I know whose I am, and I set my hope on the grace to be revealed, as Peter says in, in chapter 1. Maybe one more question. Thanks, James. Yeah, good question. Are you speaking more about this text or generally? Yeah, so James is asking the question about suffering and what's the nature of the suffering and can we apply it to the air conditioner not working through to more serious things? Um, we live in a broken world and, and things aren't what they're meant to be. And so whether we call it the broken air conditioning or stubbing our toe, life can hurt. Disagreements with our spouse, um, broken relationships, not necessarily because we're Christian, but it's suffering, and I take it we can go to God in that. But I, I do think 1 Peter's focused especially on suffering for being a Christian. So, so it's similar to the last question. It's focused in on suffering for Christ, but it applies very nicely to how to bear other suffering, being in a broken world, dealing with the pain of, of lost souls around us. I, I find that very burdensome, but I trust God with it, and I know ultimately he'll... He's trustworthy and, and he'll make all things right. Even his justice is, is trustworthy. But he talks about the fiery trial you're enduring there in verse 12. So he keeps pointing to indicators of um, real and present suffering.